Welcome to La Mia Italy, a series of short videos about Italy by a Brit with Italian blood who's lived in Britain and Italy and loves them both. I've had a guilty secret pretty much all my life. It is that I love Fiat's, and especially the small ones. I'm not sure why I like them so much, but it's probably something to do with the story of Fiat being so closely tied up with that of Italy itself, and it's a story that is worth knowing about if you want to understand Italy. There are also things to go and see, so I'll be covering those in this video too. When I was a child, my friend's parents had proper cars like Ford Cortinas and Vauxhall Cavaliers, but we rattled around in an old Fiat 500 or Fiat 126 and eventually a Fiat Panda. The low point was a Polish Fiat 126 which had been driven from Poland and converted from left-hand drive to right-hand drive and rarely worked. When I learned to drive, I had several Fiat 127s and until recently I had a new Fiat 500. The only reason I don't currently have a Fiat is that I'm not sure anymore that Fiat is sufficiently Italian for the cars to retain their character. The new Fiat Tipo, or Dodge Neon as it's known in some markets, is just an ordinary decent car. Fiat was founded right at the end of the 19th century by Giovanni Agnelli in Turin. His grandson Gianni ended up taking over the running of Fiat in the 1960s. I'll be doing a separate video at some point about the Agnelli family as they still own much of Fiat and play a key role in Italian business as well as becoming icons of Italian style. At its peak, Fiat employed over 100,000 people in Italy alone and produced cars, high-speed trains, aeroplanes including jet fighters, tractors, lorries, buses and made up a sizable percentage of the entire Italian economy. But they were best known for their cars and especially their small cars such as the Topolino and Fiat 500. It was Fiat which brought the motor car to the ordinary Italians in the boom years of the 1950s and 60s and beyond. As a child, I would stand on my grandmother's balcony and look out at a mass of Fiat 500s and Fiat 126s parked higgledy-piggledy all over the place. Growing up in Britain, I found very few people shared my love of these small Fiats. They tended to rust, they were usually slow and often unreliable and suspiciously foreign. But their bad reputation was undeserved and Fiat has played a massive role in the development of the cars we see on the roads today. An underrated classic is the Fiat 127, which many say was the first modern hatchback when it was launched in 1970. It wasn't just the hatchback that was innovative, but also the transverse mounted front engine and the space and light in the interior. Just think about what an achievement that is and what percentage of cars today are hatchbacks. It was designed by Pio Manzu, who sadly was killed in a car crash just before the car's design was finalized. The car deserves to be a classic and sold over five million units, although rust, does mean that they're relatively few still around. Fiat's designs went all over the world with plants and affiliates in places like Russia, Poland and Spain. The Fiat 124 was the basis for the Vaz 21011, which we know as the Lada, of which over 17 million were produced, making it one of the top three cars for production numbers. Many were made in the Russian city of Togliati, named after the Italian communist leader in honor of the Fiat Soviet joint venture. This mix of communism with big business, eastward-west, was entirely typical of Fiat. Fiat survived the difficult years of the 1970s, including the oil price shock and years of terrorism and civil unrest and strikes in Italy. It was a close-run thing and its owner, Gianni Agnelli, excelled at juggling all the competing interests, even coming to rely on Libya's Colonel Gaddafi, who took a significant stake in the struggling Fiat. But other Italian car companies were doing even worse, and Fiat took over Alto Bianchi, Lancia, Ferrari, Abarth, Alfa Romeo, Innocenti and Maserati between 1968 and 1990. Quality issues dogged Fiat, especially the tendency to rust. There are all sorts of stories about the reasons for the rust. Cheap steel from Russia, strikes meaning untreated metal panels were left outside, and Fiat ended up withdrawing from many markets. Cars were also developed on the cheap and old designs were restyled rather than being replaced. In fact, Fiat epitomised that old Italian concept of the art of getting by, l'arte di arrangiarsi, of doing just enough to survive, doing deals with the unions, politicians, Libyans, Soviets and goodness knows who else. It wasn't all doom and gloom and cars like the Fiat Uno, Punto and the new Fiat 500 or Cinquecento did very well. Gianni Agnelli died in 2003 and was replaced by his grandson John Elkin, who relied heavily on Sergio Marchione, who in his own way is part of the Italian story. Marchione's family emigrated to Canada from relatively poor Abruzzo in central southern Italy when he was a child. He was mother tongue Italian but educated in North America, and like many migrants he ultimately returned to Italy, in his case to run Fiat. He did what would have been hard for a non-Italian, or for that matter an Italian, which was to question how Fiat globally was making a profit but losing money in Italy. 
was the role of Fiat worldwide simply to subsidise Fiat in Italy. As Fiat had done in the past, it gambled, and in the financial crisis of the 2010s took over bankrupt Chrysler on favourable terms and turned it round. But it still wasn't big enough and Fiat is now in the process of merging with Peugeot to create the fourth biggest car maker in the world. Whatever happens, I'm sure the Agnelli family will do very well, and it probably does make economic sense, but I am worried that Fiat's will become better, but more boring cars. Will Fiat still make cars like the Coupe and Barchetta, or will they be worryingly like rebadged Mazdas? So what can you see of Fiat if you go to Italy? Well, Fiat is closely associated with Turin, or Torino, as the Italians would say, and you can see its historic Lingotto factory, the one with the test track on the roof. The factory closed in 1982, but now contains the Fiat headquarters, as well as a shopping centre, which means you can visit the famous track on the roof. There is also the Centro Storico Fiat Museum in Turin, with over 300 models from the Fiat Group, although for Alfa Romeo aficionados, you're better off going to the Alfa Romeo Museum in Arese, just outside Milan. I'm sure there are loads of videos on YouTube about Ferrari, so I won't cover that here, and to be honest, I don't know that much about Ferrari. But the best place to see Fiat is on the Italian roads, where there are still plenty of soon-to-be classic Fiat's being driven around. I'm very tempted to buy one, but I can't help but remember how my Fiat spent so much time in the garage that the mechanic, Franco, became a family friend. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please consider subscribing. We're doing more videos along similar lines. In the meantime, in bocca al lupo, and I'll see you all soon.